The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the forest primordial gains sentience, contacts aliens for asteroid delivery, then puts those cute monkey things in charge and goes back to sleep. South going quarks and April E. Arcs. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We continue with part two of a two-part interview with author D.J. Butler, who discusses Witchy Winter, book two in his Witchy War saga, and the sequel to Witchy Eye. Dave Butler talks about how he created his unique world set in Jacksonian America, some of the sources for the North American magic systems he uses in the book, and where the story and our heroes are headed. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Lee Aiden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals. Now here's the news. The April E-Arcs are here. Now an E-Arc is the mathematical expression of the complex path that a cat that is mostly black with a few white markings takes as it passes through a quantum entanglement field with a water bottle tossed by a child who is really bad at flipping water bottles into upright positions, but who is too stubborn and perhaps too dull to give up. Nope, that's not it at all. An e is an electronic advance reading copy. We sell them to you early so you can read your favorite author or favorite series months before the official release and try out new offerings too in the raw, as it were. The only caveat is that we haven't proofread these little book babies yet. Out now is Monster Hunter Memoirs Saints by Larry Correa and John Ringo. This is New Orleans. That mantra has rung in Chad Gadner's ears since his first days working in the Big Easy. Everything was different in New Orleans. The food, the climate, the monsters. The real reason New Orleans is so different is a larval great old one growing day by day in power and just about ready to pop. If Chad can't convince the powers that be to get involved, not only New Orleans, but the entire world is going to fall under the power of the nastiest of nasties. Also out now, need I remind you, is Uncompromising Honor, EARC, by David Weber. Honor keeps your promises. The Solarian League, for hundreds of years, they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. And wouldn't you know it, they've decided the upstart Star Kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Honor Harrington has worn the Star Kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor does. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League. And hell is riding at her wake. She is deadly and uncompromising. Wow, what an April shower of e which just goes to show that T.S. Eliot was way off base when he said April is the cruelest month. But he might have had something when he added, I will show you fear and a handful of dust. So out now is Monster Hunter Memoir Saints by Larry Correa and John Ringo in e form and Uncompromising Honor by David Weber in e form. They're available exclusively at Bain eBooks. Get there via the Bain.com website. This is part two of a two-part interview with D.J. Butler discussing fantasy novel Witchy Winter. Part one is available on last week's podcast. I want to welcome DJ Butler, Dave Butler, uh, to the podcast. Hello. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you again. Uh, DJ Butler grew up in swamps, deserts, and mountains after messing around for years with the practice of law. He finally got serious and turned to his lifelong passion of storytelling. He now writes adventure stories for readers of all ages, plays guitar, and we have heard that on the podcast, as a matter of fact, and uh, spends as much time as he can with his family. He is the author of City of the Saints, 
Rock Band Fights Evil, Space Eldritch, and uh, Kreshling from Wordfire Press. These are, uh, I believe, YAs. And Witchy Eye from Bane Books uh, from last year. Right now at booksellers everywhere is Witchy Winter, the sequel to Witchy Eye. Uh, Sarah was hidden away, and that's, that's, I mean, basically she didn't know quite who she was at, at, in Witchy Eye. Um, now she does. Um, her father was, um, the occupier of the servant throne, right? Before. Yes. And. Yeah, he was. Sorry, go ahead. And Thomas Penn's sister married him and she had three children that Thomas Penn doesn't know about. Yeah. Or has just. Yeah, and she has three children. Uh, oh, sorry. I keep talking over you. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, uh, and has just and has recently learned about, and they are a big threat to him. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Curates is uh, um, the Lion of Missouri is sort of his uh, uh, his folk title. His his uh, there are songs about him as the Lion of Missouri, uh, and. Um, we we see uh, in book two and more in book three um, one of the kind of themes or ongoing elements in these stories is that there are ancient alliances and arrangements to keep in check the the dark powers of the cosmos and uh, and in the cosmos. Um, even the Ohio River Valley is the cosmos, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and those alliances have fallen apart. They're they're defective. Uh, they've fallen out of communication. They've lost the knowledge they once ha- once have uh, once had. Um, uh, they they've lost their power. So as we see more of Kira's own backstory in book two, as Sarah gets to her father's kingdom, Cahokia, and tries to sort of force her way in because no one really wants her. Um, we we start to see that uh, that things were messed up before Kyrie. The, the lines were broken. He, he was not handed clear traditions himself. Uh, he was handed riddles uh, and was only able to find partial solutions. And some of some of the some of the forces that that uh, some of the people and 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 movements that that broke that tradition are are still active. We see them especially in Book Three, uh, and get in Sarah's way. So so Curious, Curious uh, was a was a bit of a, a renegade princeling, young man, kind of a kind of a prince hal. Nobody expected him to amount to much. Uh, became a military hero, uh, fighting the Spanish, and then and then became became king. Uh, and now we're going to see in book three that his kingship was, was incomplete. Uh, he, he had a secular kingship, but there are, there are, there are sacral aspects of it that he did not solve. Um, and, uh, that Sarah, Sarah has to, has to figure out and resolve for herself. But he was a dashingly romantic figure and, um, uh, and uh, brought uh, justice and order to the wild lands of the Missouri, uh, and, uh, and was a hero, and, and married the, married the Penn landholder to become, uh, you know, the imperial consort. It's kind of one of the. He was he was a king, and therefore an elector. He was a king of the one of the seven Mount Dover kingdoms, Cahokia, and therefore an elector under the compact. Anyway, he was already a prominent man, but then he married the empress uh, and became an extremely uh, powerful figure. Um, and that now I'm, I'm going to recount some straight, this is straight up spoilers for book one. So if you haven't read book one, I'm sorry, but that's, that's what you get. You should go read it now. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, he, he's a, he's a, it's this romantic marriage, this vaguely kind of scandalous. He's sort of a foreigner, you know, uh, and, um, and then, uh, while he's out riding the borders of the kingdom in the West, uh, Thomas arranges his murder. And he's killed, uh, but he doesn't die instantly. He's uh, he's, he's mortally wounded, uh, and he knows he can't save himself. Uh, but he anoints. He takes three acorns. Uh, he's in he's in a wood. Takes 
three acorns and he anoints them with his dying blood and sends them sends them back to his his wife with his uh with his close companions um and uh somewhat to their surprise she eats the acorns uh and then gives birth to children uh and the children all have strange deformities uh and gifts and she does this all sequestered when when he, when uh Thomas has Curious killed he then sequesters his sister as as a as a mad woman so her pregnancy and the birth happen outside of his view and those same close servants those retainers of uh of Curious uh and and of the empress uh smuggle away the children hide them in the far corners of the empire and and we 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 see Sarah first in book 1 who's been raised as a foster child of Iron Andy Calhoun the one-armed uh Calhoun elector from the Nashville area uh and and in book 2 we see the others yeah uh Nathaniel who is tormented by voices he can't he doesn't see what they are where they come from uh and and has has falling fits um, and has as being raised as a, as if he were a bastard child of the Earl of John's land, which is to say, North Carolina, not far from Bain offices, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, and then this, and then the third child we see her, but only very little in the second book. Um, and she is, uh, she, you know, the, the the sort of biblical model for her would be Samson, although popular culture now would would be more like the Incredible Hulk. Uh, but she's been hidden by uh, with a with a Catalan noblewoman and pirate, uh, and has been living in the bayous and on a pirate ship uh, for for the first fifteen years of her life. Yeah, she's um, and we see a lot of her protector in this book, uh, Montsi, uh, yep. Montserrat is I guess her first name, um, yep. and. Uh, well, let's for just a moment. Let's talk about Nathaniel. He he hears odd voices. He's a he's kind of a of a of a strange lad that uh, that we follow um, as he starts to uh, as he starts to figure out who he is because he has absolutely no idea at the beginning of the book, right? Yep, he has he has no idea. He uh, so the the Earl of John's Land is himself mad. Uh, mad since his son died, uh, really in the, in the same events that, that brought the baby Nathaniel to his house. Um, but the Earl agreed to and is committed to, uh, caring for this baby. And so he, he, he raises him like an, like an orphan. Uh, and, uh, he has, he has an, he has an orphan's name. Uh, and as happened um, uh, a lot historically, you know, a lot of historically orphans are often given uh, surnames that are uh, that are sort of meant to invoke a blessing. Uh, you know, your last name might be Temple or Church or, or God Bless or something. And this and this is true here in Jonesland. Although there's a mix of Christian names, so he's named Nathaniel Chapel. Um, uh, and also, uh, and also, uh, pagan names. So the following, uh, following John Churchill's reversion of England to a kind of synthetic neo-paganism, worshiping, uh, Woden and, uh, and Thunor and Hearn the Hunter, uh, and Wayland Smith, uh, that's the, the, that's the, the Earl's uh the earl's religion uh and so some of his some of his orphans have uh um you know sort of uh, pagan names so so he's raised basically as a kind of like a bastard you know question mark maybe bastard child but but anyway just just a foster child an orphan around the estate he hears voices um that sometimes seem to be in pain uh and, and he hears a hears a, a grinding shriek uh, and and sometimes a shriek becomes a, hears it at all times. Sometimes it becomes so much, it, uh, it it knocks him into into fits, knocks him out. And uh, and and he is he is in fact uh, he is the healer that uh, Mayangan, uh comes to find. And what Mayangan's Manidu uh, his Manidu, it is what his his patron spirit says to him 
is, look, he's, there's a healer, but you're going to have to heal him first. Uh, and uh, and so uh, th- their paths intersect because because the uh, because Mayangan comes looking for him. Uh, and and one of the uh, so again, I, I've, I've tried to write uh, magic that in various ways is is authentic either authentic to kind of intellectual understandings of magic or and or authentic to actual traditions. So so uh what Nathaniel experiences uh ultimately what what's uh it doesn't make him less weird. It makes him differently weird. Um but it uh is a is a shamanic initiation. Ultimately the thing that uh that saves his life and gives him control over this sort of extraordinary power of heal of hearing um and makes him ultimately a, a healer uh is a climactic point at which he leaves his body and ascends into the field of the stars uh which he sees inverted because he's standing in it in the pit of heaven um and, and which he sees with the stars configured the same, but resulting in different and strange, um, strange constellations. And there are suggestions that what he's experiencing ultimately goes back to another another branch of humanity or something close to humanity, the, the red-haired giants that once filled the land and that now are only in remote corners and especially in the north. But... Uh, but up in the pit of heaven, uh, Nathaniel is torn to pieces by cosmic ogres, and he is reconstructed with iron bones uh, and with a quartz-shaped, uh, sorry, an acorn-shaped piece of quartz pounded into his uh, the ear through which he has been has been hearing um, all, all these voices, and that experience gives him control. And he can hear the voices, he can hear the spirits of, uh, of of the world, of the universe. He no longer hears the screech, but can hear the music of the spheres. Uh, and he 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 gains the ability to leave his body and enter the spiritual world of the stars um, at will uh, for the purpose of effecting healing. He he ultimately. Uh, through his ear and the acorn that we, he was born with an acorn in his ear through that acorn and this initiation becomes uh, becomes a shaman although that word doesn't appear either um, and uh, and and the healer yeah it's really cool and it and it does I mean if you know the shamanic tradition it follows it very closely the uh, that scene is really cool and and I will also say it has a very cool moment when a bear lights a match. <laughs> <laughs> Which is perhaps not in the shamanic tradition, but that I appreciated a great deal because it's just cool. <laughs> so, um, well, all right. So that's Nathaniel. We have Sarah, and the final uh, of the triplets is a sister who's down in New Orleans. And New Orleans is its own like weird spot. It's got this um, this bad guy. It's got two bad guys, sort of. Um, um, one is called the Chevalier, and the other is uh, Etienne. Um, who's becoming the bishop? What's his last name again? I'm f- spacing on it at the moment. It's Ukwu. Yeah. Ukwu. <clears throat> and he uh, is is A W U Ukwu. Uh, he's very connected with the um, with the voodoo tradition as well. Um, yeah. And this is also where uh, Monsi has has um, been hanging out on her excellent pirate ship La Verge Cannibal. <laughs> with Margarita. Um, so tell us a little bit about the that milieu and who these characters are as well. Yeah. So the the biggest so now um the setting is is in some ways in 1815 America and and in some ways it's it's different. Um well, for example, one of the differences is uh, in 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 real history, a lot of Native American populations suffered um, right around the time of first contact with white people, and probably as a, as a result of that, although I think there's research that suggests it might might not be um, decimation by horrible diseases. Uh, and in this setting, that didn't happen. It didn't happen because of 
the their 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 league with the beneficent Peter Plowshare. So you see much larger populations and and self self ruling and some participating in the empire and some not. Uh, Algonquin and uh, and Iroquois and and other groups. Um, another way in which it's different. Uh, is some of the migrations from Europe and from Africa are earlier, uh, and uh, and so the the urban centers are much larger than they really were in 1815. So New Orleans and New Amsterdam and Philadelphia are 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 very very large cities, and uh, New Orleans is uh, is uh, corrupt and and decadent, unlike in real life, uh, and uh, it's uh, it, it's it's been ruled by two branches of the same family. And uh, this, is a, this is an old French family, and the, the Chevalier or the Chevalier is, the, is uh, 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 Des Moines or Le Moine, um, and uh, he's, the, he's the secular ruler. Uh, and until recently, the, uh, the, the bishop has been basically a, a cousin branch of the family uh, called the Bienville. And uh, before the story starts, uh, sort of in the, in the recent past, there's been a dramatic change, which is that uh, the... Uh, uh, now, now, here's another change between this, this setting and the real world. There's no pope. Uh, since the Borgia pope uh, turned Turk, the institution of the papacy fell apart. Christianity is organized on conciliar lines. So, you know, who, who appoints a bishop? Well, it depends on, on, on the region. We, we have a council of bishops, or maybe some nobleman gets a say. Um, and uh, so there's a group called the Synod that has appointed, uh, for the first time in the history of the city, a righteous man as its bishop. Um and he's bishop as as book one opens, uh, and uh, and they haven't done this out of disinterested motives or because they you know uh, motives of faith. It's because they want to annoy the the chevalier. They it's, it's to be a thorn in his side. Um, well, uh, again, spoilers for book one. Sorry if you haven't read it. Um, that bishop does not survive uh, the first book. Uh, and so, uh, as, as, uh, as the story opens in book two, one of the questions is, well, who's going to replace him as the Bishop of New Orleans? This is, this is an important role among other things that, that bishopric, uh, that bishop is an elector. That person gets to vote on key issues of policy for the whole empire, right? Whether the emperor can have an army, who will be the new emperor, et cetera. And, uh, and it turned, and it turns out it's the, it's the bishop's bad son, uh, Etienne Uku, who, when we see him in book one, is a uh, is a money lender and a leg breaker and a gangster and a voodoo priest. Uh, and we see him in book two. We see we see from his point of view for the first time. We see that he's got uh, he is a participant in a mariage loa, a, a spirit marriage. That his. Uh, he is married to Ezuli Freda and Ezuli Danto. There are two goddesses, a virgin and a crone, who he, he is celibate in his physical life, and he is married to these goddesses who give him ecstatic powers of charisma. Uh, and, that, and we see that the reason he's done this is a, 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 a promise to his mother on her deathbed to take care of his father. And now that his father is dead and he blames the chevalier, um, He's going to make war on the Chevalier and try to bring him down. So it was a lot of fun to write. Yeah, it's fun to, to because they both basically employ magic against each other to try to. Um, and the Chevalier is after um, is after Margaret as well. Um, what what's his motivation? What does he want out of all the of this geopolitical stuff going on? Yeah, he he ultimately, you know, his family has lost. Uh, has lost power. Uh, their territory has been has been has been shrunk, uh, and their uh, their they they lost the bishopric. Uh, and his his motivations uh, really are uh, a sense of obligation or debt to the past. He's haunted by the greatness of his family. Um, 
and uh, and and a desire to restore them, and uh, and that's going to lead him to do some fairly dramatic stuff uh, at the end of book three in his in his showdown with Etienne. Yeah, well, he is. He kind of he will he'll do anything to advance this cause. He kind of reminds me of a Jack Vanceian sort of uh, character somehow uh, from like Dying Earth or something like that. That uh, in that he is. The ultimate utilitarian. Oh yeah. So. Well, so for example, his his son is murdered in chapter two, right? The bishop's son, not the bishop's, the um, the chevalier's son, the chevalier's son is is killed in chapter two, uh, and the cheval- the chevalier is uh, hires the murderer <laughs> to to advance his cause. Right, absolutely right. He's he's cynical, and he's he's cold, uh, and uh, uh, and he's haunted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the whole New Orleans uh, New Orleans section is is really cool. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Sarah um, and her retinue. She's she's um, the focus of. Uh, I mean, the, whether Sarah succeeds or not is whether Good will succeed or not in. Uh, in a lot of ways, um, and she is headed toward Cahokia, um, and her her father and his people have have built these mounds. And in your world, they're although it, maybe it's sacrilegious, but they're not uh, necessarily they're they're sort of a product of the two races of um, of the American Indians who inhabited America or the North America before any Europeans came over and the Europeans who did come over who were the, uh, the, the refugees from sunken Atlantis. Right. And they were, uh, the elves. Am I getting that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, there's two, there's two migrations, uh, uh that are referred to, uh, so, uh, and it's actually, and I don't use this name because it's a, a modern archaeologist name, but it's actually Doggerland. So, so in the real world, um, between uh, England and Denmark, there is an area of shallow sea, and there's a there's a bank out there called the Dogger Bank, um, which which has been for hundreds of years a great fishing spot, uh, and um, and apparently it turns out. <laughs> learned this recently uh, that for forever uh, fishermen from England and probably Scandinavia have gone out there in the middle of North Sea and fished and they have pulled up human artifacts um, but if you do that if you go out there fishing and you pull up like a harpoon head or you know a sewing needle or whatever you don't tell the authorities because if you do they'll make you stop fishing and it's a great fishing place so so uh, well, it turns out now uh, with uh, with with uh, I think basically kind of sonar type technology, sound waves, we can map the bottom of the North Sea, and we can see that uh, that there was a time when it was inhabited by human beings as a fertile plain, and what is now the Dogger Bank was a mound of was was a range of hills near near the mouth of the Rhine. So the the Thames flowed out west along the channel, but the Rhine flowed down through what is now sometimes being called Doggerland, past some bodies of water near near uh, a large bank of hills and then in, into the sea. Um, and that's actually, uh, that uh, primordial land is, is where the first migration comes from, uh, comes to, comes from, sorry, comes from to the, to the Ohio. So, uh, and, and, uh, thousands of years ago, uh, and, uh, and then there's a second, much more recent migration, which is basically sort of the 30 years war, um, where, uh, some of the, some of the, uh, the, the, the firstborn, the, the Ophidians, the children of wisdom, uh, come as refugees with the great general Albrecht von Wallenstein, uh, and, uh, and, and some, some, uh, allies among the children of Eve, uh, and, and they come out, uh, and join their kin. Um, 
So yeah, so there are uh, kind of primor- some of the kingdoms have uh, really old connections with some of the Native American groups. Uh, one of the one of the kingdoms is said to be half Lenny Lenape. Uh, others have really strong connections with the descendants of Wallenstein's uh, immigrants, who are in who are the the German duchies in kind of your Chicago, Wisconsin, uh, and and Minnesota area. Um, so there's so there's a complex history, um, and and yes, it goes back a long time, and it it mixes in with various groups. Yeah. And the person who and that's where the the throne for the what the Ohio River Valley, the Midwest, basically is right. Is that somewhat accurate, or yeah, there's a. Yeah, so we haven't we haven't seen fully the kind of nature of the seven kingdoms. And Cahokia is is, is right across from St. Louis uh, in real life, so that's that's right. That's where it is. <laughs> so. That's where it is. Yep, and that's where it is. Uh, and Cahokia in real life is an ancient archaeological site, and and I believe that the name Cahokia comes from a much more recent band of Native Americans that lived uh, in the region. So a more a more recent document, their name got applied to mounds, uh, uh, but I, I don't think there's any uh, uh, connection, genetic connection between them and the very large urban culture that did in fact flourish something like 1,600 years ago plus. Um, so uh, yeah, that is so that is Cahokia, uh, one of seven kingdoms uh, of. of these uh, uh, these firstborn, these elves, if you will, um, and uh, Cahokia is, is sort of the it possesses it uniquely possesses the serpent throne. It uniquely is understood to be the place where uh, this people's goddess manifests herself. Uh, its king is uniquely its king or queen is uniquely believed to have a, an intimate connection through the throne uh, with, uh, with that goddess. So that, that sort of makes them naturally the leader of the whole, um, all the space between the Ohio and the Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's cool, uh, way that your imagination has moved in and out of the, of the reality. Um, well, let, um, so Sarah's traveling along with, uh, Calvin, who we who we met early on uh, in book one, Bill, Jake, Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about the the folks she's um, with? Yeah. Uh, so um, we should also mention that there are also beast kind in this, in your world. Oh uh, yeah. Yes, who are uh, in some sense the the subjects of the Heron King. Uh, on on the western bank of the Mississippi River, um, but also sort of not really in the real world, not really in the physical world. There's it, there's the the there's another throne, sort of a, a counter throne to the serpent throne, and that's where the Heron King rules and his people are the beast kind, uh, and uh, they are um, no two of them look alike. Uh, they have animal parts, they have extra limbs. Um, they look like some kind of crazy uh, teratogenic uh, monster spawning process is still going on, uh, kind of you know trying new combinations over and over again where, wherever creation happened. And um, so uh, at the end of book one, Sarah actually uh, wins uh, in a tr- in a in a trade uh, wins the allegiance of a of a platoon of these creatures. So that's part of her retinue. She, uh, she travels with, uh, Bill, uh, Captain Sir William Johnston Lee, a former Imperial officer, uh, who was the one who hid Nathaniel with the Earl of John's land, um, uh, at, uh, at his birth, uh, and who then basically has lived in an exile in New Orleans for 15 years, uh, Bill is uh, Bill is very quick to take the initiative. Uh, he's very decisive. Uh, he is uh, he's a, a pistolier. He's a great shot, um, and he's also an idiot about a lot of human things. He's terrible at language. Uh, he he doesn't understand money uh, very well. 
Um, and he's, uh, he's sort of Sarah's bodyguard or, or military leader. Um, his, uh, his, his sergeant, he's got a couple of sergeants. One of them is, is one of the beast kind who's sort of like a, a fawn or a satyr, uh, but with coyote parts rather than goat parts. So the kind of the hind legs of a coyote and the head of a coyote, uh, named Chikak. Um, and, uh, and then Jake, Jacob Hope, who was a who was a deaf mute abandoned by his uncle uh, on a trading voyage, uh, and who was working as a as a menial kind of guard on the prison ships, the hulks of the Chevalier uh, out on the Pontchartrain Sea, and who was possessed by Simon Sort at the outset uh, of his of his reign, uh, which which changed him. In some ways, it gave him the ability to speak, but it also made him a very, very rapid learner. Uh, but it also kind of uh, uh, broke him or left him with strange memories, memories that are not his memories, but that are memories of the God. And they're, they're horrifying memories of, you know, mass sacrifice and, and, and uh, cities on fire. Uh, and... Uh, and uh and so and now he you know so bill doesn't quite trust him but 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 kind of has to uh in part because sarah's gift of sight allows her to see uh that simon's for for whatever jake's faults are and whatever his strangeness is the simon sword is no longer in him uh kathy is also part of the group uh kathy is one of the fun things kathy is uh in part uh you know, in a role-playing game, the healer, no one wants to be the healer. The healer's always a very boring character uh, because all, all the healer can do is, you know, heal, heal the other people. Uh, Kathy is a, kind of, is, is a kind of a healer, uh, but she's also a lot of other things, including... Uh, so she, she was, uh, she was a, a, a novice uh, in, in, in a hospital of St. William Harvey, uh, a circulator, they call them, uh, when she was younger, uh, but she's been living as a as a prostitute in New Orleans for the last decade, and she becomes a sort of advisor to Sarah, uh, the advisor who is not attached to any other institutions, and in some ways can be the most disinterested. So she's kind of a, a consigliere as well. Um, and then Calvin, who who uh, who is in love with Sarah and is just not lucky uh he's uh because she has bigger things she has to do and other equipment she has to make uh yeah. calvin calhoun is uh he grew up with her and uh becoming yeah yeah from the beginning he grew up with her thinking they were cousins yeah uh, and uh <laughs> and was happy to discover they weren't <laughs> yeah. and uh and uh, I, I like writing Cal. He's a very he's very pragmatic in in sort of everything he does, um, and he's he's self sort of self effacing and, and self sacrificing and a good guy. He's a, he's a cattle rustler at the uh, tracker, and he, he's a trader, uh, and uh, and he's he's a good little lasso and a tomahawk. So uh, yeah, yeah, Cal, Cal. Uh, Cal has kind of a hard end in book two. Things things do not go his way. Mm. Uh, I have a feeling we might see him again, though. Uh, yeah, perhaps uh, it, the way. So, what about uh, what are you, what are you working on now? Well, I'm very close to finishing the uh, book three, uh, which I which I'm very excited about. Uh, this is sort of the, the subtitle is Secrets of the Serpent Throne. And this is where, again, we see more of, uh, Curious Elitharius' story, including we actually see him. Uh, and, uh, and we see that, uh, that, that for all of the legend around him, in some ways he was a, he was a failure. Uh, and, uh, so when we see, we see the serpent throne in book two, uh, it's in a spot that is obviously meant to be consecrated and hidden behind a veil, but the veil is open. Uh, some, something's not right, uh, and, uh, and so that's a that's a piece of his um, his his quest or his uh, what what he was trying to accomplish that he didn't uh, that Sarah's going to have to. So that that's 
that's kind of the climax I have to right now, um, and it's got some uh, some fun uh, plants that are going to pay off now in the climax, including down in uh, uh, New Orleans. Um, and uh, and then I have to figure out uh, I have to figure out what else to write. Um, I'm uh, I'm I'm thinking I would kind of like. Uh, to do something in a Fawford and the Grey Mouser sort of vein, you know, um, lower fantasy, a little bit of a kind of a gritty, maybe slightly dark, but sort of buddy comedy kind of tale. But 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 I haven't haven't written yet. I'm I'm noodling. I'm thinking. Cool. Well, that sounds that sounds super cool. Um, and we'll look forward to that. Right now, at booksellers everywhere is. Witchy Winter, which is book two of, uh, I guess we're calling it Witchy Wars series. That, that's right, Witchy, Witchy War, yep. Witchy War series and the Witchy War series um, by DJ Butler. Uh, Dave, anything else that uh, we might want to add about uh, that, that we haven't covered that uh, about Witchy Winter and, and everything else? Well, well, I will, I will say this. Um, I read, uh, boy, I forget who it was, uh, some long essay talking about, uh, about, uh, Bob Dylan and, uh, and whoever it was said, Hey, uh, if you don't understand the extent to which Bob Dylan is, is telling jokes, then you don't understand Bob Dylan. Now, I'm not saying I'm Bob Dylan, but I will say that one of the fun things for me is to be, is to write in historical or um, pop culture jokes that are hopefully subtle enough that a reader uh, is not thrown out uh, of reading. Um, but they can I, they can be found because I've had I have readers email me and say, "Wait, is this an Elvis reference?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> or Hey, hold on. I think this is Creedence Clearwater Revival. Am I right? <laughs> and and uh, or or ask about historical jokes. Uh, and 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 so if you are reading and you encounter something, you think, well, is this possibly a crib from Dr. Seuss? The answer is yes. It is possible. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all kind of cool Easter eggs in there as well. This, I mean, this book is just brimming over with with um with imagination and cool stuff and wonderful characters and um everyone should get it it's witchy winter by dj butler dave thank you so much for uh for talking to us about the book tony thank you totally my pleasure this is another entry in alliance of equals a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corville's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mounted armed attacks on others of Corville's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Chapter 30 Langlest Port Sean stepped into the shower, turned his face up into the spray of cool, fragrant water, and closed his eyes 
Langlest Port was open to the weather, which had turned quite warm toward the end of their day. He sighed in satisfaction at the sweet-smelling coolness and imagined dust swirling away down the drain. They had accomplished rather more today than he had hoped for. If tomorrow went as well, they might return to the passage the day after. He found, perhaps not surprisingly, that he wished to return to the passage very much. Langlast Port could, without fear of overstating the case, be judged a successful encounter. Certainly, it was worthy of being incorporated into the developing route as a primary port, and the proximity of those jump points clearly argued that it be placed on several secondary routes. He would need to do some redesigning, but that was, in the larger dance of the universe, a small thing. Sighing in sheer pleasure, he began to soap his hair. The shampoo smelled even sweeter than the water. He would exit the shower as redolent as a garden in bloom. He took a deep breath of damp, floral air, seeking for a moment at least to mitigate the taste of stone. Memory flickered, and he abruptly recalled standing at the edge of Treala Fantroll's gardens, gazing up at the house, which had been emptied of all that Yosgalen cared to keep. He was not alone in the blue evening. His sisters were with him, Nova and Anthora, Priscilla, of course, and Renzel, Valcon, too, who had been raised as a brother to his Yosgalen cousins, inside the clan's fortress, Treala Fantrol. The evening breeze, damp from traveling over the stream, sweet from tumbling the flowers, played about them, a seventh in their circle. They joined hands there in the shadows, power flowing between them like water, while the breeze gambled sweet and chill. Nova was a rememberer, and it was she who led the way. Priscilla helped her step into a trance, whereupon she opened her eyes on the past, when there had been no house in this place at the mouth of Corval's valley. Her vision flowed with the power around the linked circle, until they saw it, all and each of them, a meadowland innocent of man's hand, the breeze combing out its silky grasses. Holding the vision firm, together they desired that it become truth. And Thora and Valcon led here, strong-willed and stubborn, forcing the vision into a reality, while Sean and Priscilla ensured that the flow of energy remained constant and the clarity of vision did not falter until the moment that it became real. The grassy meadow and the tall house existed simultaneously, each wrapped in glowing strands. In that moment of duality, when they stood equally within two realities, Renzel extended his will and broke the strand about the house. The shock of that unmaking knocked the six of them to their knees. Even the breeze faltered. Dazed, they knelt in the grass, their accord broken, until, one by one, they gathered themselves, looking up at last to see a grassy meadowland, surrounded by formal gardens, and the moon just rising above Solcintra spaceport. Aboard the passage, Priscilla woke all at once and swung out of bed, pulling her robe around her as she crossed the room. The calm chimed even as she put her hand on it. She smiled slightly and touched the switch. Mendoza? Master trader Yos Galen for you, ma'am, said Comtech Triloff. Private channel. Thank you, Sally. Please, put him through. Hello, love. Her voice was as clear as if she stood next to him. Warmth filled him, and perhaps heat, 
though that was a route laid through frustration. Really, Sean, he told himself, do try for some control. I miss you too, Priscilla said in his ear, her voice suddenly sultry. That's a score on a wounded man, my lady, he said with what dignity he could bring to bear. And to think that I called you for comfort. What's happened? Happened? He smiled. In fact, nothing has happened. Paddy failed to murder a textile broker this morning, though I swear as her master trader that she would have been perfectly justified to have done so. The third master of the technology exchange is a very pleasant fellow. Besides being fascinating on his topic, and eager to teach both an ignorant master and an eager apprentice. He produced a sane and sound scheme for mutual profit, and we signed the contracts quickly. The account is formally under the master trader because I had made first contact, but I believe I will assign it to Paddy, as she seems to have an aptitude. Certainly, Master Seert was charmed by her questions. He paused, seeing in his mind's eye Priscilla leaning a hip against the calm table, her robe wrapped loose and her breasts glowing. Really, Sean, have you no sense of self-preservation? Did I wake you, he asked, dismayed to find that he had lost track of the shifts. No, I woke just before the calm chimed, she said placidly. Tell me what else didn't happen. You have most of it already. We called upon the ornamental ironworks, as we had been asked to do, in order to discuss our catalogue. Though we enjoyed a gay time and a wide-ranging discussion, in the end it was simply found that we could not accommodate each other's needs. We parted with protestations of goodwill and presented ourselves at the Luthiers' Hall where the catalog was also the proposed topic of conversation. There, however, we found much to recommend an association between us, and we'll be sending down a five-wood sample case. After that, we paused in our labors. A paddy had found us a convenable and not entirely ruinous restaurant, where we refreshed ourselves with lunch before making the rest of our calls. The first we called upon regretfully concluded that we should not meet her needs. The second specialized in beads that react to various environmental and chemical conditions by changing colors. Not fire gems, but perhaps kin. Paddy had an interest there and might have come to an agreement on the spot, but the firm's official signature was out and about other business. We may call tomorrow, or perhaps the next day, in order to pick up the completed paperwork and to present ourselves properly to the signature. Our last prospect of the day also was interested in the catalogue. We stopped there but briefly. Then we occupied ourselves by paying cold calls to those shops and halls for which we had not gathered contact cards, leaving info keys and catalogues at each. When we had accomplished that, we returned to our humble lodgings, where a buffet had been laid. We elected first to bathe, and Vanner has said that he will take his meal in private. Paddy and I will meet in a few minutes in order to plan tomorrow and talk over today's business. It sounds like a great deal of nothing has happened. Priscilla commented. In your place, I would have chosen a nap before either a meal or a bath. There was a small pause. He felt her hesitation through their link. Priscilla, when do you think your tour will be done? She asked. I believe we will return to the ship on the day after tomorrow, he said gently. Pursuing all of this nothing is rather wearying. After we're back aboard, I may wish to spend a day at the station, if I can bring the station master and the yard boss together with me. 
I will be all joy to see you when you return, Priscilla murmured, and he smiled for the intimate phrase that had become both a joke and a promise between them. It sounds as if Patty is having some success, Priscilla continued. How does she go on? Well, better, I may admit with no dishonor to the apprentice herself, than I had anticipated. And you? I, he sighed silently, knowing that she would hear it regardless. I am a little tireder than I ought to be. I am growing less and less fond of the taste of grit, but there seems no escaping it for the moment. The protocols I put into place remain strong, even under extreme provocation. I think that our schedule is prudent. Have you spoken to Lena? I have. We talked over techniques, and we have a plan in place. I've made arrangements to be available at need. Excellent. A silence fell between them. He felt her through their link. The strength of her desire humbled him, even as it kindled him. There was nuance, of course, love, tenderness, wistfulness, and surprisingly, a tiny undercurrent of fear. He cleared his throat. I should stop indulging myself and allow you to return to bed, he said. I know very well that starship captains have more than nothing to do, even in orbit. She laughed. Oh yes, like waiting for the next arrival of the customs cutter and watching it send out its cameras and measuring drones. What? No paperwork, no crew crises? You disappoint me. I'll try to do better, she said, with a smile in her voice. See that you do, he replied with a smile in his. Good night, my love, she said then. Sleep well. Give my love to Paddy. I will. Dream sweetly, Priscilla, he answered, and then soft as a kiss, out. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a nice vacation cabin in the upper branches of Yggdrasil, a pink Cadillac that roams the west searching for its lost owner, who is time, and cold shoots of thanks and praise to DJ Butler, author of Witchy Winter. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. 